Well, it's a great pleasure to be talking about the subject seven herbs, both the plants and the, the seven stories. And we're going to emphasize the seven stories more because we're in a shul synagogue and that seems appropriate. And it's a little intimidating to me because it's like, there I was kind of self-taught scholar out in the middle of nowhere, like um, uh, virtually never going to a synagogue or shul and um, although I did take Hebrew at the University of Minnesota, a secular institution, and um, so kind of self-taught about uh, interpretation of uh, Genesis or Reshet. And, um, but I found great, great meaning in these stories, and I do want to um, uh, share, share them. And it's clear they're, they're not just, I, mythology isn't quite the right word for it. They are encoded stories with profound meetings about, basically, I would have to say, they are the shamanic path, um, the seven rungs on the ladder of the shamanic ladder, that would be Jacob's ladder, and those are the great stories uh, of the great patriarchs and matriarchs, um, of both of, um, of humankind and of the Jews in particular, or the Hebrews, we could almost say at that time. And um, so, uh, they're, they, they are um, really profound stories, and I thought I'd give you my like take on them first because it's so peculiar, and yet I feel it's so justified by the context. I'd say first they are very carefully arranged stories of spiritual growth in uh, conveyed in like folk tales or nursery rhymes or nursery tales, and but but they they. They circulated in, in oral history or oral tales in the Middle East for a long time, and they seemed that they still are circulating as far as the, the Sufis are concerned, because these same stories are known to the Sufis, and Jacob, uh, Abraham, etc., and that they have meaning that way. And at one point, they were not... Um, you know, they were simply not written down. And it's interesting. This is William Blake. So William Blake discovered through spiritual vision that the stories in Genesis were originally were based on uh, frescoes on the walls of the temples in early Mesopotamian civilization. And they represented a seer's history of creation. And he writes, of course, we always have to take um, William Blake. Just, you know, he's such a fun, <laughs> he's so fun. The artist having been taken in vision into the ancient republics, monarchies, and patriarchates of Asia has seen the, those wonderful originals called in sacred sh scriptures that cherubim, which were sculpted and painted on walls and temples, towers, cities, palaces. Those wonderful originals seen in my visions were some of them 100 feet in height. Some were painted as pictures and some carved as basso reliefs and some as groups of statues, all containing mythological and recond recondite meaning where more is meant than meets the eye. So is he actually seeing this or is it like a vision in his head? Yes, both. <laughs> 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 well, he would take it. For him, imagination was reality. <laughs> so he does talk, he does mention talking to Isaiah and uh, I don't know, Euclid and Plato about, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering, like, are, are folks familiar with these stories? Like, how many people have, like, actually known the Genesis stories kind of growing up? Oh, just about everybody does. That's why one, another reason. Uh, everybody does not, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, they're part of culture, though. You know about Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark and stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. And Cain and Abel. Those are, you know, they're like, you know. I don't know, first twins or something in uh, um, uh, Navajo. So from those pictures then, he said that then they were like turned into uh, oral histories and carried all around by the, the um, uh, nomads of that area and continued. And I, I would give as an example. And so then they were incorporated into the Torah, the first five books of Moses, quote unquote, um, of, um, although I, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I'll give my idea of who the writers were originally. And, um, and so uh, 
they um, they became more and more formalized and they became more monotheistic for certain. I, I would say a good example, I do want to give an example of one case where I thought the um, account in uh, the Quran was more original than the one in the Bible, and that's where um, Moses uh, um, is instructed by Yitro, by Jethro, and uh, Moshe, and um, so Jethro is his father-in-law, and there's a long thing where um, Je Jethro basically gives um, Moses in a whole long story about uh, a, a lot of advice about time management. It's secular advice. He was a priest of Midian, quote unquote. Okay, so but in the Quran, he is he's he's actually Al Kidder, the green one, the perpetually green. Wherever he sits, the green comes up and Moses. No, uh, Jethro. Yeah, Jethro. So Jethro, that's the name. That's Al. That's Al Kidder. That's um. That's Yasser. Also, that's um. And it's a Middle Eastern name, of course. So, so in that one, uh, Al Kidder is the instructor of Moses in kind of you know theological, shamanic, perhaps magical secrets. We might say, and he's got a much more interesting personality because he's perpetually uh, he's not actually green, but wherever he sits, green springs up. <laughs> so that actually. Seems I think that 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 Yitro has been um, uh, edited, but at any rate, um, so um, another editing. So who were the writers, or what? Who wrote, or the writer of Genesis? Um, so I do follow the biblical scholars J and E, and then the redactors. So J was a writer in the Southern Kingdom, uh, that would be the Judea, E in the Northern Kingdom. That would be uh, Israel, and um, the preference. And Jay was a better writer, I would say, or better storyteller, and dominates generally in the account. And also, the account goes down to uh, her her account because there's a lot of people think it's a woman now. Um, her account goes down to about David, at least, or Solomon. And so, so the people that suggested she's a woman said, "Well, look at I mean." How many stories about women are there in this this book? Like on and on about uh, Jacob and all his wives, or um, then there's and about kind of jealousies and good and bad things going on in the tents, you know, kind of in the women's world. Um, and then has anybody? I I actually asked a mythographer, do you know of any other mythic cycle in the world? That has as many accounts of childbirth of what was going on, of the of the actual exact birth, and she couldn't come up with anything except pure myths where you know the child was born. You know, I mean, just where it was mythological. These are actually detailed breech birth and all sorts of things. Detailed. Uh, you'd almost have to be a midwife to write them out, which gives us the next idea: who were these? Who was this woman? Or women that wrote these stories, at least Jay. I don't know about E, but Jay is the one considered to be a woman. Well, I think it was Rosenthal, the guy who suggested this. Um, he says, he says, oh well, it's probably a princess who was a uh, daughter of uh, Solomon, who was educated because she was privileged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like the stories don't read like somebody who was privileged would really um, have written that. And so I think that that I I think. I, <laughs> Hey, somebody can doubt me, but I think that uh, midwives maintain these stories for some reason, that they were the official storytellers or a official storyteller in the um, ancient Hebrew world. And furthermore, what's rather incredible, so you'd think like how many 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 year old books, like because the Torah is pretty old contain the names of midwives, the actual names? <laughs> well, there's two midwives named, actually, in the account, the two midwives who saved Moses' life. So I find that kind of interesting, too, um, that they're named they're named by person, and um, that um, at, at some point, midwives were very highly esteemed on these books, when the prototypes, when the ancient, Jay's separate from, is incorporated into a later account. 
I think it's likely that Jay then was um, written down by a man, probably um, could be a woman, but I think that this is maintained by by um, um, midwives. And I think too that they were part of their duty was to look at the birth and and it's not astrology, but it's like what happened at the birth, and that would be prophetic for what would happen with that child because that's actually also in the stories too so so that i i think i um and publish this so somebody will think of it eventually <laughs> or i'll publish it sometime but i'll probably make no splash doll but it makes so much sense to me i cannot see any other way that it could be true like any other thing that could be true so um Okay, so at any rate, that's a general background on where these stories came from. And I do think that they were maintained, like Homer, like the great epics, like the Kalevala. They were maintained by oral historians who were, like, really serious about it. They weren't just, oh, let's tell the kids a story. They were maintained very carefully and um, by all sorts of people, originally by everybody, and then, you know, then the Jews um, or the Hebrews, I would say, at that point, you know, kind of maintain their 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 cash and other people and etc. With these stories surviving down to fairly modern times um, on this side of BC, at least um, among the Sufis. So, okay. Um, so, why are how, what do I mean by that? They contain these recondite meanings, as uh, so we can we can have both. That Blake said, mythological and recondite meanings. Uh, what is recondite? Oh, hidden, deep, profound. It's a great word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be worth googling, but yeah. I'll google it. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so then, so there's really seven great stories here. Um, Adam and Eve, um, Cain and Abel, um, Noah and the Ark, um, Abraham and Sarah, and then Jacob and Rebecca, and then Joseph, uh, J Jacob rather, and his wives, Jacob and Esau, we could say it would be better. Jacob and uh, Well, Jacob and Esau was his brother, and Esau has a, uh, or he had four wives, or um, Two wives and two slave girls, I guess you'd say, or servants of his wives. And then um, Joseph. And Joseph's pair is not his wife, but really Tamar, who is a really fascinating character in the book. And almost the strongest, I would say she is the strongest character in the whole book, which again makes you wonder uh, who wrote this book, you know, and the birth of her, the birth of her kids is very, very detailed. Jacob's wife? No, she's uh, Judah's. Well, that's part of the story. That's you know, remember that. That's one, that's a fascinating story, and really like shocking. <laughs> um, first, it'll be in the Bible, and even just that anybody pulled it off. So, okay, so um, like I'd say too, what makes these? Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, what makes this shamanic? Always in the shamanism, they're always the secret language the language of the birds and the bees or the language of the of the of nature the language of the the green tongue the um uh language of the animals um and i do like the green tongue the best that was david Ovasin was a particular author he traces an old french langua vert the green language contrasted with langua overt talking about the obvious <laughs> so the secret language. Well, there's a lot of that. So just to, um, some things are so obvious. So, and yet they're so forgotten. So Adam and Eve, oh, God, I've heard that a hundred times. So Chava means life. And, um, well, let's see, let's go back. We'll start here. So, so first we have the first chapter of Genesis, which is more of the that was one of the redactors is a little bit more scientific. I don't like all these folk tales. Then we have the one the person who told all the stories. So Adam made out of dust and Adam means um, human, really not a individual man so much, but the whole species. Adam. And Adama is earth. Yes. Right. 
Adam and or dust or soil or yeah. So and he is made out of dust. Yeah. So which is kind of like and this is kind of amazing too. Like although yes, Hebrew is a Semitic language, you just cannot help but think there was some scientific technical language in in words in Mesopotamia that are Indo-European or Sanskrit, like because it's just like Atma in in um in Sanskrit means primal particle, you know, a spiritual particle. And then Adam in Greek means primal physical particle. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any question that's all from the same. And so like atoms and, and molecules, like that comes from Adam too. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then um, Adam is created. Then Adam... God asked, Adam's still a very passive individual for quite a while here, all the way until even Eve makes all the decisions. <laughs> but so uh, God asks him, oh, do name all the animals. Could you, do you know the names of the animals? Or, so yeah, okay, so Adam names all the creatures, as they're called. And what he named them, that is what they were. It's like, and this led to this doctrine, the rabbis called uh, uh, Adam Kadman. I don't know if that's pronounced correctly, Cademon. Uh, the archetypal Adam, which is universal worldwide, that there's a divine human archetype or a human archetype of creation. I always say, well, if we were rabbits, it might be the grand rabbit, but we're humans. So so, so it's a grand hu human. And actually, many of the ideas of animal medicines, like bears for adrenals and deer for the nervous system and rabbit for the more nervous nervous system and uh, fight or flight, I would say. <laughs> and um, so animals are parts of the, of the, the um, human archetype who is Adam. So, and then as soon as Adam names all the creatures, then God or the Lord says, um, and is there a partner for you in all of this? You know, I don't have quite all the words down, but Adam says, no. He says, well, are you, are you lonely? Uh, and uh, Adam says, yes. And like, I, I, I've thought about that a lot, almost as if, because that's not explained, but there's almost like a loneliness built into creation, you know, out of separation comes a loneliness, you know. And so then God um, puts Adam in the sleep, which people just, oh, Adam is in a sleep. Of course, we have to do surgery. <laughs> but this is like the spirit world is hidden from us by, by sleep and dream. And the animals do live there. And um, because, oh, well, the warm-blooded animals, they dream, they sleep. The cold-blooded animals don't sleep the same way. They don't really have true sleep. The, the warm-blooded animals have feeling, heart. We didn't invent any of this. We just invented self-consciousness. And they have heart, feeling, they have sleep, they have dream, they have instincts, and um, they bond maybe for a season, for a lifetime, like wolves and coyotes even bond for a lifetime. And um, a eagles made for life. And, yeah, some of them don't, but the reptiles don't at all. You know, it's like, hi, goodbye. And it's also throw the okay, the eggs are in the soil by and so they don't take care of their young. That's the main thing. The warm blooded animals have the pouch first, take care of their their young. And the they hunt and pack sometimes, they operate big social units. We are really grateful that rattlesnakes don't hunt in packs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so the warm-blooded animals, I do look upon them as living in paradise. I somewhere I this is great. This is a life changing vision someone had of giant animals, like they're just giants. Well that's cause in this paradise. Um that's like how our mind can't conceive how great they are and their archetypes. The they are so they're the archetypes of all the animals. There's wolf there, not all the individual wolves, but the wolf. And we too are there as the human, you know. But then fall to, through time and space into uh, the waking world out of uh, and hidden from us in dream time. And then, and then the famous um, God takes rib out of Adam and um, to uh, make Eve. Well, let's see, rib. Rib is supposed to mean in Hebrew, tzela, 
tent, kind of like support of a, the rib of a tent. Only when I looked it up, it's like, holy cow. Now, I must admit, my book, what I look up Hebrew in is like, not by the rabbis. It's, by, it's 1810. It's, it's kind of by an occultist, I'd say. So, an occultist, actually someone that would be at the Rogue Library. Uh, yeah, Favre de Olivet. Um, and he just gave one, oh my God, one... Um, I mean, it was so interesting, all the different um, um, associations of that word, so that I'm trying to see if I can find them. Well, one thing it's very closely related to is command. Um, it's related really? to the Hebrew, yeah, it's, re, it's very much related to the Hebrew word, uh, letter tzadi, which um, means fish hook, which doesn't, which just sounds so, which is what it looks like, but sounds so mundane, but... But that's because you get stuck on a law, you know. When you begin to see the whole range of associations of the word, so it means yes, a tent, tent, um, a tent, rib, an architectural element. <laughs> it's what someone translated. Finally, it means um, uh, command. It means um, the top of a mountain. Actually, also um, the ridge, ridge top. It means. Um, and it means a kind of ridge pole, and it means, or kind of like a tent would be built with ridge poles like that. And I was telling a friend about this American Indian, interesting, which said, "Oh, this is like the pyramid in in Egypt, where I was, like, um, like you know, um, nut, you know, stretched across creation, like with the whole stars embedded in her and stuff." And um, it's like that's an aspect that I would say is like the bedrock of creation as the laws of nature. And that's what I think that refers to. I mean, these stories are so pulled back to just a single symbol word. And maybe the original storyteller would actually, um, could explain that to a student, but there, it's not so clear to us, but, but it's really the, it's like, it would be a irresponsible creator that would create a, a universe that had no laws, you know? And, Eve or Chava means life. So that's more the organic side. So it's like the laws of nature or creation and the organic organicity. So Adam and Eve are now organic. The, 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 um, the human archetype has become organic. Really, they are not that different from the animals, though. What the, do you mean by organic? Yeah, versus all. They're alive. <laughs> yeah. Um, like the archetype is, has is now in flesh. In fact, and, and it says, and God covered the place on a side o over with flesh. Yeah. So they are flesh. And, but they're not, but they're still like, um, you know, it's like the consciousness is still in the archetype, like the animals, like Adam is the, uh, Adam and Eve are the uh, conscious being, not us individuals. And even, in fact, let's see, so so I found um, even the word, I mean, this just went on and on and on. Not only this is this like tent, architectural type, top of the hill, shadow, and um, cast by the hill, um, which is kind of like the underworld in a way, perhaps, you know, maybe my imagination is going crazy, but, but, um, but even turtle, turtle is actually, it comes from the Saudi as well and has, it's a little more remotely related than some of these other things. Um, so, oh, okay. So this is um, okay. So this is commentary on that part about the rib, and it says some scholars suggest this relates to the Sumerian story that new Ninti, meaning either Lady of the Rib or Lady of Life. And her name is similar to the. Newt in Egypt, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So. Did you say that also in shadow? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And also, these commands are kind of unseen in a way, too. The, the flesh is seen, but this is the more hidden part, perhaps. Yeah. We're not going to talk about the. Oh, 
Well, Liz is in the, in the story, so I don't talk about her actually. Yeah. She's not in the Genesis. She is before Genesis happened. <laughs> well, she's not in there, so I'm going to stick to exactly. I I'm not. Before Genesis. Before, I mean, in the Hebrew Bible, we're talking before Genesis. Right? But in the history, there might be, but. Yeah, okay. Ah, okay. The herbs we eventually get to. Uh, I use this very Christian herb, but Easter lily or um, the lily, which is um, associated with polarity, with like, and that's Adam and Eve too. But I do want to go on a little bit, if you don't mind, um, just because um, uh, some of this is it continues to be fascinating. So, um, so uh, we have. Um, uh, uh, well, at any rate, so then I, I began to, um, I couldn't, I couldn't believe this. I'd read this other book on the uh, Central American Mayan underworld geography and every single thing mentioned in the story or by these word plays or related are also mentioned. So this is just this quotation from the historian at the, as the spiritual voyager continued to descend, he or she eventually encountered the the still more profound realm of the holy first father decapitated dead created thing <laughs> the roots of the vision spirit uh, vision serpent world tree and the place of the first true mountain cosmic turtle shell womb tomb of the first mother at the very heart of shabalba where the underworld turned into the overworld <laughs> that to me is actually what that whole story describes no this is from uh, this is from my. Uh, this is from Mexico. So, it's, oh, this uh, it could be, but this is actually a historian just describing. He's probably um, summarizing a whole bunch of different scripts. Um, Gillette is his name. Nineteen ninety-seven. Yeah. Um, so, what does that have to do with? The well, crime? I just think okay, the turtle shell, the mundane shell, the mundane world, as um, mm -hmm. the mundane shell, as Blake called it, or the esoteric. The male and female, the world tree, the serpent, the the um, kind of origin place, the underworld. It's all described in in mythology, both in the Genesis story and and elsewhere. So it, maybe that seems like too much of a <laughs> yeah question. Yeah. Maybe. No, she asked originally where that's from, and the the, the Mayan Genesis story is called the Popol Vuh. And it's so similar wow. to Genesis. It is a paper in college. And I was like, oh. Wow. Cool. The flood and everything. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, here's actually where I have some of this. Um, Sav means command. Um, and D Dolivet, who I like because he's, well, this is very Greek to say this, but the same consonants with slightly different vowels become su or tau, actually, order, command, or law, even as if impressed by the prima mobile, by the prime movement. Uh, tau, it's pronounced that particular um, uh, Hebrew word. Um, oh, this is amazing, too. And that's Sabawat, um, the host of the spirit serving God, the host of Jehovah, um, as it would be in the King James Bible. Um, that's the stars, and they are up there on that. So, I mean, it just goes on and on, these these associations where you really continue with this word. Um, let's see. Cell uh, without the, the aleph on the end means anything extending overhead like the host of the stars, a canopy, dais, covering, roof, veil, everything deep, obscure place, a cavern, very yin again. Uh, and then also uh, means a shadow. Uh, okay, no, so you think you're getting pretty hot out there, you put up your tent, at least you got a, some of a shadow. Some. So at any rate, there's such a, so, um, okay, so, uh, and then saint actually, or tzaddik, straight arrow, a righteous person, Noah and Abraham are called tzaddik. So um, that means, that means literally a straight arrow in, in Hebrew. I like that so much better than righteous person. <laughs> well, okay, so that's the main story. So the main story goes on and on about, you know, as we know about um, you know, disobedience or becoming conscious, like grasping the fruit of self-consciousness, self-determination at that moment too. And then 
becoming conscious, and then actually that's when the individual, when the um, archetype is no longer, it doesn't say that, but the archetype is no longer our commander, and we come, become individual souls. And Wait, 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 what? Yep. The archetype is no longer commander. Well, like the animals see, originally it was the archetype that was the conscious being, so to speak, that determined everything. The wolf, all the wolves are kind of ruled by the wolf. And so it was like that with humans too, until the we became conscious, self-conscious individuals. And the last thing, but the most important thing, is the last thing that God has, Creator has, Adam and Eve do, is take off the fig leaves and put on furs. And um, all through these stories, animals are very important. And to me, that's as if to say, you can't trust your human self, your self-consciousness, and the really the snake part of you, you can't trust either. That's inside you too. Now, you can only trust the animal part, the warm-blooded animal. That's where the love comes from, the dream even. Uh, this is a very shamanic interpretation, but, but I, I feel like that's valid. Okay, so the first story is all about um, like the alienation. It's about separation. It's about opposition. That separation may even be, like I say, the loneliness built into um, creation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the first of the seven plants, the Easter lily. So, this is partly. Oh, I can put it. Um, it's to me, it was like it's like the uh, the Holy Grail. I hate to jump traditions here, folk Christianity, we could call it. But the and that and what was the Holy Grail? The Holy Grail is the openness to the spirit or to something bigger than oneself, or to acknowledge the the polarities within oneself. And even in the ancient Chinese uh, documents on Chang Chong Ching 200 AD, when he describes Easter Lily, he says how the person's conflicted and can't make decisions. They're, they're associated, they're thinking about one thing, they want one thing, they want another. A little, about how, how, a little bit like how we consider chamomile, but I wouldn't put chamomile in here, but, but wants something that doesn't want it, conflicted like that, kind of uh, a little like separation and I look upon so Easter Lily is very good for kind of accepting oppositions within yourself and growing above that and becoming more um, it's not whole and it's, it's becoming more multi-dimensional two-sided I don't want to say duplistic I mean double in a good way becoming open, becoming, you can, it's like you and the other person can get along better because does anybody have a better way of saying it? No. Well, I mean, when I read that about Easter Lily, it's like those people who can't see their shadow. Yeah. Like oh, that's, they're yeah, that's they're it. like, they can't see it. They're just oh, like, that's even better, have this but, like image of themselves that they're perfect. Right. Yeah. And so then, and it's yeah. like, they can't see it. So they can't integrate. It's like they're here and this is so far away from them. So it's, yeah, that's really well put. So self and shadow. Yeah, yeah. Well, even more to, toward integration. Mm -hmm. so whatever you... Yeah. It's like the slut and the, you know, and, and the virgin, right? It's like, yep. you know, right. we're not either. Like, or sort of it's like, like both. Yeah. Right. Well, it's like, the, you know, that <laughs> Desire whole... and, like, standoffishness or something, or so desire and, or to be with others and to be by oneself. Yeah. But it's like, you know, in order to heal, you know, we have to be able to look at like the parts of ourselves that are not perfect, right? Yeah. Like that's one of the yeah. steps. Yes. So why is the Easter lily? I'm not sure. I will look at the plant. It's a very interesting process. It's a deeper resonant exchange. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think that when you can accept the oppositions within yourself or your shadow, then something higher comes in. Yeah, that's true too. Within oneself and then with others too. Yeah. So, yes. You know, um, I, I just to go back a little bit, I've yeah. been really fascinated can't trust people to just Yeah, it is kind of anti-herbal. <laughs> oh. That's just totally fascinating. 
<laughs> yes, you get to the next story. Yes, that's exactly where that has a next frequency. Yeah. Well, so, but, but, but that's. Well, the big leap is a plant. I know. I have to say, as an herbalist, I'm like, huh? I'm not totally sure. But so it is the serpent in the tree. Well, the yogis say, oh, that's a kundalini. And that's pretty accurate. It's the desire nature in the nerves, but that, and in the back brain, perhaps. And, and that hadn't been woken up. The, no, that, well, that was, that was woken up. But, but the top, the, so it was the meeting of the back brain with the human um, forebrain and the self-consciousness and the the serpent is still with us because the reptilian back brain is the survival instincts and we have to have that while we're at when we became conscious we also had to have that and because you it's like hey i gotta go to the bathroom right now it's not like huh like what oh i'm thinking about something <laughs> it's like Snake is talking right now. <laughs> and uh, so it's this uneasy piece, and there's this, and therefore the uh, seed of the woman shall step on the head of the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the serpent will bite at the heel of the, of the human. And that the Christians say, oh, that means Jesus will stomp on the head of the serpent. No, the, the, the story means that, that those two sides fight within us. That's like the the ego, I, and that's the biological needs, and the part of us that says, well, I don't want to go to bed yet. I, the little kid, yeah, I want to stay conscious or, like, I want to control my sex instinct because I don't want to be overwhelmed by all this stuff. I, I want to, you know, so it's the ego versus all these animal, these biological instincts, really. Um, and that's a polarity, and we're stuck in that, and that's part of that two sides we have to um, accept, and one really sees, you know, the serpent ends up being the shadow for the most part. So, um, yeah, so, um, so, Easter lily, well, it is a great female remedy. I, I do have to admit that it is excellent for um, cysts. Uh, it's almost specific, like, um, and for fertility, because it gets rid of... So cysts in Chinese medicine are looked upon as stagnant qi, or stagnant mucus. And so soft, movable cysts. Breast cysts that come and go with period, and also mucus and, um, and cystment, like uh, uterine cysts, like the egg descends, gets stuck with mucus, gets stuck in there. This is a very good fertility medicine. And... Um, uh, and it's good for breast cysts as well. It's also good. Twice I've treated men who had cysts right here. I don't know what that is. Um, what is the male version? But um, carrying a burden? I don't know. But um, so it's off movable again. And um, male or female, it's it's a really good symbol for a kind of people who are idealistic too and don't accept that hidden part of themselves. My friend David Milgram who's a chiropractor in Flagstaff and he's used this many more times than me. Many times he said you know it's like even if the person's been you know incest victim violated, whatever they still have this ideal they still are the Easter Lily type or whether they're just you know a kind of a nun you know. So um so, uh, or for male men too, it also has this opposition of, you know, kind of what the desire and the the archetype, the the animal desire and the the ideal. So, so it's and it, it's a beautiful plant. Um, and I did, I mean, one could write a, a whole thing on the Holy Grail, I think, as a representative of accepting the polarity within us and then becoming a vessel or a vehicle for a higher vision. And it's pretty interesting because it's not part of the canon. It was opposed really by the monks and the church. It was part of the troubadours and the, the singers and uh, what was the, the Holy Grail, Grail. Okay. Oh, the Holy Grail, which it is, I think, the piece we associated somewhat with. But, um, Okay, so so we have yes, so um, leaf and 
Sure. Um, so somehow, I think the leaf, I would take the plant part of us as representing the pure, the vital, like brain dead, but your vital statistics are fine. That means a vegetable, as we would say. That's that part of us. So we have I mean, for the mineral part of us, the, the corpse. Then there's the vital body lying there, not doing anything, but totally alive. And then there's the animal part of us, which is the nervous system and perception. And we get our senses too from the animals, which is so important. And finally, then the human part, judgment and decision-making and, you know, learning from our mistakes. I I gotta say, if we're going to make decisions, we're going to learn from our mistakes and from our successes. So that's, and that's a polarity too. So, so for some reason, I still don't totally understand that. Yeah. You're not supposed to rely on your plant self. (laughs) You got to rely on your animal self. And I do see, I really have come to venerate animals, warm blooded animals so much more highly and to think highly of them just that they gave us sensation well that's all the animals period they gave us um instinct that's all the animals too i think but they gave us dream and sleep and a heart and you just you can't have a dog without you know i mean yes the 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 heart it Animals have a heart, you know. Well, you raise horses, so you can tell them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then they do dream, and you see them wag their tail in the dream, whatever. You think she wants on the level as coming out of the Garden of Eden, which seems to have a paradise climate where you can just make it to the rest of the parts of what we experience now winter and snow. yeah. Well, the fabrics aren't really gonna, they're not gonna like keep up with that. So, hers would be more likely to. Yeah. Well, well, just my. <laughs> and also, we became aware of our nudity. Yeah, that's right? what the fig leaves have to do. Yeah, the fig leaves represent. <clears throat> why are you wearing fig leaves? That says, why are you aware? You know, oh, uh, you know, <clears throat> well, we're naked. You know, well, who told you that? <laughs> serpent told us that okay so it represents the actual sin itself so to speak the, but the awareness of self-consciousness so so i don't understand that totally why it would be you know imprinted on the plant level i get I, I guess you could say they were tricked by the tree the snake and the leaves kind of represent the tree perhaps um i guess on a, another level the hebrew ancient hebrews were they were animal people, not they were stock raisers, not farmers. And there's a prejudice that's very marked through um, the whole um, <clears throat> Hebrew Bible uh, in favor of animal raisers. <laughs> it, it goes on and on. So it's figurative and the Yeah. I can't remember which one you used those, but not the public. Yeah, that's that's on this very ancient story, but it still continues where, I think in King Solomon's time, there's still uh, Hebrews living out on intense raising livestock, and they're venerated as a more pure expression. We settled down. We're not as good as those people. Yeah. Well, Cain and Abel comes in that too, right? I better jump to that story. Seven, just so you're just giving a little time check. Oh, uh, okay. Are we going till eight or to eight thirty? Eight thirty. Okay. All right. Well, that's the most complicated story. Okay. So we go on to the next one, which is almost most simple because um, it has to do with uh, um, it's kind of in every culture the good and bad and the two brothers and stuff. It's in many cultures, but so yes. Yeah, so there they are. A- Abel um, raises stock and gives sacrifices to the to um, God in um, animals, and uh, Cain raises um, wheat, or probably, and um, vegetables, and gives his sacrifices there. Now, we modern people would think, like, oh, that's why I don't want to go killing a bunch of animals. And there's another thing I don't understand, but I mean, in the ancient world, they just killed tens of thousands of, of cattle just constantly all over all over the world, almost. I, I don't... I, 
at least in China and uh, Orkney Islands, up there's like there's this temples there with like tens of thousands of slaughtered bones of, and then they all end one day, boom. <laughs> and it's like it's like the ancient people. I, uh, you know, I couldn't really, I couldn't understand what's the recondite meaning there. Um, one of the authors said, "Well, it's like learning about our animal selves. It's like learning about." Or the forces of nature within us, the animal within us, and and we see that in the in the Noah story, where all the animals are represented, and the lesson is from all the animals all together. But at any rate, so so God doesn't like that offering in the land, you know, and it's like that's like as the Native Americans would say, self-appointed. Like, uh, oh, I made that up myself. You don't like it though. I, I made it up. Whereas Abel was somehow following the inner. Um, uh, that's the inference, I would say. So, Cain kills Abel. Cain's a farmer, and yet what it says is he loses his land, really. He becomes a wanderer. He he ends up in the land of Nod, which is Hebrew for wandering. So, well, he loses his land, and to me, he's the type, therefore. I, I meditate on this one a lot, too, whereas Abel, his blood calls up from the earth for vengeance, but God just, like, no, nope, we're, we're not doing it that way. So he's he didn't lose the land. He remains there. To me, this is like almost a spirit. It's like Cain is like the hungry ghost or the wandering spirit that's afflicted by guilt or something, whereas Abel is a sufferer. But he retains his place in creation, his home in nature, because, you know, for both, um, for both, uh, Julie and myself, we both had that experience. Nature is alive, and it's really is kind of like your spiritual home, like all encompassing the soul world, I would call it. Um, yeah. What is the mark A lot of people have, yeah. Uh, yeah, because he does not kill him, he, he marks him. I guess you'd say people don't trust people that have committed murder. <laughs> I guess we'd have to say the market is internal and we feel it. Yeah. Well, that's also like, because he gives Cain a chance to admit his problem, but he doesn't. And then it's magnified. There's seven generations and the seventh descended is like really vicious. It just kills for no reason. You know, so it gets worse. Yeah, what? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, that's a really good idea. Because in many ways, these things, so that would be really working into footmark and its associations. Yeah, but that, I think, really fits well. Yeah. Be yeah. Ah, self-awareness, yeah. Because the whole story is also self-awareness, like like Adam and Eve, like um, God says to Eve, and in suffering shall you bear children. She doesn't get it yet, though. You know, you're killing the, kill each other. Like, there's going to be suffering. There's really going to be suffering. So um, that is a manifestation of just how bad it, that decision was in a way, you know, except for well, what happens, happens, so. But, um, yeah. Now, Blake, interestingly, says in the Cain and Abel world, there was only two of the four elements. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, maybe fire and earth? I can't remember earth either, but, um, I like, but now I realize he's saying it's all good and evil, and there is no real good outlet yet. It's like the story isn't finished there's just this polarization. It's not happy for either Cain or Abel. It's that polarization that we first saw in the first thing, and now it's. Let's, so, so yeah. just, just for just to uh, review the story yeah. of Cain and Abel, just yeah. so you don't mind. Yeah. Um, can I just say it? So basically, yeah. um, Cain brought his harvest as an offering to the Eternal, and Abel brought an offering of his lands and flock. The eternal one loved Abel's offering, but didn't do Cain. So Cain was filled with rage, right? And the, and the eternal one said to Cain, why are you so angry? Um, 
And then why your fallen face? Would you not do well to lift it? For if you do not do well, sin is a demon at the door. You are the one it craves, and yet you can govern it. So he's basically oh, wow. saying, you're angry, but you can control that. Um, but Cain now thought about his brother Abel, and then when they were in the field, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. But God basically said to him, you have this power to overcome it, but he, he couldn't. Then the eternal one said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Uh, Abel says, how should I know am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> And God said, what have you done? Your brother's blood is shrieking to me from the ground. Now you are cursed by this very soil, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. When you till the soil, no longer shall it give you its yield. Right? So now the soil is polluted. You shall become a rootless wanderer on earth. And Cain said to the eternal one, my punishment is too heavy to bear. Seeing as now you have expelled me from the face of the soil, I must hide from your face, and I am become a rootless wanderer on earth, and anyone who finds me might kill me. Not so, said the Eternal One. Should anyone kill Cain, he would be avenged sevenfold. And the Eternal gave Cain a sign that no one who came upon him would kill him. And Cain went away um, and settled in the land of nomads to the east. He settled in nomads. Settles. That's the land of no, the land of the no Yeah. What did you say? Uh, nod. Uh, nod means wandering. Yeah. Like again. Um. So there's some prejudice here. This is probably it. Appear he, later his descendants are enumerated, and they're like kind of like gypsies. They're not the actual same gypsies that showed up in Europe later on, but. So landless people are like cursed in a way is like what the story is saying to or would it because the Hebrews, they may have been tended their flocks, but they felt they had a land. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's more there than there's a lot there, I think. And it's, it is real interesting about the, the demon gnaws at you, but you can control it or the spirit gnaws at you. That is pretty interesting. I'd forgotten about that part. It is saying like, um, it's, it's just your simple spirituality, religious Sunday school. <laughs> That's your basic Sunday school lesson. <laughs> Try to do good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, right. Control yourself. <laughs> okay. So the plant here. Um, is yerba santa, which grows around here. Um, and, you know, anybody wants to, you know, find by inspiration, not just make up uh, plants that can fit, you know, we could, there probably is something like uh, Easter lily that's here. Um, but at any rate, yerba santa is here. That means sacred herb. And so this is kind of a greetings story of the sacred and the profane both like of um, uh, of um, uh, let's see um, uh, is it, sorry I got distracted but um, so like uh, you know, kind of boundaries, I would say, uh, the sacred. What is sacred? It's a boundary. This is actually part of my original experience of this plant. But at any rate, what this plant really helps with is like bringing to the surface hidden shadows, hidden elements of your personality that you don't want to face, that you're not aware of. It's pretty valuable, actually, hidden problems. Um, I remember one time I had one apprentice and she started having tachycardia and I mean, I realized this woman had come over and was jealous that she was there, that she wasn't the apprentice or something and attacked her. And we had to figure that out. And the Urbisanta was what helped reveal that. It's like, Oh, that's not what I was expecting. I thought maybe she had a heart disease, you know? So, uh, we were getting ready to go to a clinic or something near there. Well, that's a kind of extreme example, but but Yerba Santa really helps to bring out hidden things. 
So did, was this a personal attack that she, she verbalized it or she just no, was she poison just, dart? Kind yeah, of poison stuff. dart. Yeah. So you, how did you use that? To, to well, we didn't know what was going on. And it was a mystery. So it's like, this doesn't make any sense. Why? You've never had tachycardia before. So um, she took that herb. And then it, we both kind of became aware of it, like, oh, that's what happened. And then the tachycardia went away. So, um, are there any physical symptoms that are associated with like these? Batteries well, that you yeah. Use? Okay. So this one is associated kind of with the deteriorative cough. I've actually had to use it recently. Like out east, there's a lot of snow, so there's a lot of moisture. So people that have weakness in their lungs are really hit hard and and have very dampness <laughs> full of water uh, and sometimes their cough reflux is real weak if they're older <laughs> this that's what it's for it's for a deteriorated cough reflux for a weakness it may be deteriorated throughout the body in other places too for weakness but um, I feel it's a remedy that brings out that that kind of taint to the system, that weakness that brings it to the surface. And that's kind of the story of Cain and Abel. And in fact, each of these, each of these seven stories, I uh, came to associate with a medical law or healing law. The, the first one is the law of similars or contraries, both of which heal, like through similarity, like sympathy, like, oh, I sympathize or empathize with you. Oh, I understand. And that brings you on that polarity or contrary. You need some discipline here. I oppose this, you know. I feel like, you know, the good parent or the good teacher is both sympathetic and able to be a disciplinarian, you know, able to so don't do that. And um, so that's the healing that begins us. And that's that openness to the spirit, to something above. And then in the second story, it's like getting the, the bad out of us, getting purifying, getting a clearer picture of what we need to do. I call it the law of spiritual law of following through. Or also the law of direction of cure in um, homeopathy. I don't want to get too much in it. But once you get the right remedy, the symptoms all start to come out from top to bottom, from inside to outside, from vital to less vital. They start clearing out. And um, that's, so that's that purification. That's really the second principle here, that you learn to see that, you know, thing within you that's not so good <laughs> and it gets brought out and and so do you have boundaries around it too are you able to see it but have like a boundary so it doesn't destroy you is that sort of well i think that's the first thing to establish a boundary is to see it yeah and definitely that took care of that one instance there um this is even beneficial for um alcoholism uh one of my friends she used it her husband was a functional alcoholic I call it and it never cured him but it helped at times <laughs> um, I don't think he wanted to be cured you know but at times when she needed him to be more on the beam she could use it um, he was a nice person when he was drunk I guess too but um, <laughs> but it wasn't you know it was a weakness it was a deterioration of character that's kind of what this remedy helps you with where there's some character fault perhaps you can't see as David said David Milgram he said uh, uh oh I'm having a Yerbasanta moment like not the one you want it's not the tarot card you wanted to pull <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like you don't want to see that side of yourself. <laughs> You're disappointed in yourself when it comes up, kind of. Yeah. So. Um, but the, if the first one is Easter Lily, where you like have to admit yeah. that, that there is that shadow. Yeah, so I know. You're open. The, the second is maybe seeing the actual things. I don't know. I would, but I would like to ask a question. Like, what I found in my life was I found people who would get the message like they received the spirit the the thing and then they ignored it that's why i call it the law of following through it's really disappointing when you meet someone like that it's like what like you saw the truth there and you didn't follow through so that's an element of it and um 
I, I do think, I mean, it reminds me of, you know, the homeopathic remedy sulfur, like bringing things to the surface too. A more dynamic remedy that works everywhere. But Yerba Santa is a plant that's like that. There's nothing quite like sulfur. But, um, you know, kind of... Uh, Could it be, um, I mean, if uh, the creator yeah. um, told Cain, you've got a choice. Yeah, yes. I think it's the choice. Yeah. So, oh, that's that follow through. Yeah. yeah. You can you you can be an asshole <laughs> or you can decide to change. Yeah. 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 The king didn't follow through. Right. No. You're really correct. Given a choice. Yeah. Yeah. And also in some ways it's like he he didn't get the lesson that was in the first thing. He chose the fig leaves and not the furs. So, yeah. So there should have been some inner checkpoint. Hey, he didn't get it. You know, fig leaves are scratchy. Oh, really? They're very uncomfortable. <laughs> 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 I'm going to figure that. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, that the, the fig has the, the fruit, which is oh, yeah. the flower, you know? Yeah. That, that whole inner row. Yes. Kind of at that beginning, you know, and that's oh. behind the leaf, which is our fruit, you know, yeah. ability to create worlds. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really, it is like a womb. It is like a testicle too, but, and it's almost, it's like it does need to open up. It must open up. I haven't really watched it as it matures yeah, it and falls on the ground. Inside. Oh. Yeah, and they die in the right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, they, right. they they drill a hole out and so because they're grabbing the pollen and then they go out. Oh. Well, some of them die, some of them come out. Okay. The babies come out. Just like regular. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. What? How does how does the seed get out of the fig though? Eventually, somebody eats it. <laughs> drops on the ground or the animals. <laughs> I think it's inside the fruit in the end. Yeah. 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 It does kind of need to open up, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it's like it opens up by going through the process of entering another body. Yeah. It, it's almost like yeah. either through the earth's body or the elements or oh, through yeah. a bird's body or through the Digestion. Yeah. Oh, it's very... And it's very alchemical through digestion. <laughs> it needs to be broken down. Oh. Oh. And then it would be interesting to try and make a clothing out of a fig leaf, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Kale works way better. There's one fairly back there. Yeah. Um, I've always uh, noticed that sin is mean without Instagram. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it's it was kind of back to that same image of the, you know, that, that there's this inner world, like when we're in the womb, when we're dreaming of an outer world, and then there's an actual outer world that exists around that one. Uh, yeah. And that when there's that original sin of that earth into that outer world, you're, you're seemingly going without your, your mother, but it's like entering into that next frequency of Mother, that, that outer layer of, um, you know. Yeah. Because it, it, it also feels like a movement from like almost like um, kind of stream. Yeah. Like this angelic archetype to this animal. Yeah. Like that, that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if fig could not be used for the first remedy here. Um, I think it symbol is kind of go beyond yourself and not being maybe open to the outside world which you know usually in a plant it personifies both extremes the plant normalizes between two extremes so i would think that it would actually help you to open up to an outside world it is mostly just used for um well, hemorrhoids is in the Bible, it actually, and it's still used for that. <laughs> and my friend Sandra, um, who noticed the thing about in the pyramid, um, a Cherokee medicine woman, she said, 
she was in the Near East in Army Special Ops, um, like a lot of American Indians. And uh, she got to know the local healers there, and they used a certain type. Oh, it was a date. Um, it was a date or Smyrna fig. No, it's Smyrna fig. Specifically, they used to get rid of negative entities. So, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, too. <laughs> Um, so this plant may really, so it's interesting that they put on an uncomfortable clothing too. So <laughs> all these things mean something, I think. Okay, so onward from Cain and Abel, it's not, there's not really a conclusion there. Eve has another child to continue, you know, the people. And um, Seth and uh, Blake comments on going to visit the temples in the Sethian period full of smoke and sacrifices of animals. So then we come to Noah and the Ark and lives in a time, so much like ours, a bad time. And But Noah doesn't go around, hey, you're so bad, you, you're you bad, you're bad, you're bad. Gee, this, there's so much of this going on. Doesn't get on social media and tell people that they're bad. <laughs> yes, I think that <laughs> happens a little bit. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, um, Instead, he doesn't point his finger. He just uh, uh, minds his own business. He just follows. Uh, God says, "Oh, build a ship." Like, oh, okay. Like in forty cubits by eighty cubits, whatever. Blah blah. You know, and then you know he doesn't. You know, and then okay, and then load all the animals in the world on in it. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> and then your family. <laughs> so, but this is this is well, this is very fig like. This is back to the fig. <laughs> this is very alchemical and very kind of Jungian, the integrity of the psyche, like the boss, as Jung would learn from the, um, from the alchemical um, manuscripts, the vas of transformation, the vessel within, the, within which the transformation takes place. So all the forces in the world, all the forces, that is the animal, animals are all gathered together, and that is all the libido as... Um, not in the Freudian sense, in the Jungian sense, our, our energies, as William Blake says, the antediluvians are our energies. <laughs> and so um, he, uh, uh, so there's that. Then it has three layers, which are in some of these alchemical apparatuses, these pictures, whether they existed or not, of like three beakers inside each other and um, on top of each other. And so that's like the, the underworld, the above world, and the middle world, or the, the like Freud's id, or animal instincts, or the animal world, or the, the primal, the unconscious, and then the conscious, and then the spiritual, the superego, he would say, or the spirit, or the susceptibility. So there's three levels, and then there's four sides, because all boats have four sides. And... Then there's four couples, Noah and his wife and the three sons and their wife. So it has the <clears throat> the four directions, the totality, which Jung would say was the, represents the totality, the completeness. So when people dreamed of a um, like Celtic cross or four-sided or four directions or four winds or four elements, things like that, he, he, they this is a dream of completion usually where they – had completed some inner process, and we're kind of getting the gifts now. We're going to get the gifts of um, uh, of um, for their payoff for their processing. We would say today. Um, okay, so uh, also, so it's only open on the top. The arc is only on, open on the top. Oh, arc! I, I was very interested. And um, this is another borrowed word, and it totally makes sense. The Hebrews would have borrowed it. It's from the Greek Argo, Argos, the Argonauts, a ship. I mean, they didn't have a word for ship. <laughs> and, you know, who are those people coming in? What is that? What do they call that? There are ships, folks. Ar Argos. <laughs> oh, okay. Now we've got a word for it. <laughs> I was reading one of the, my mother's family are Jewish and my father's family are Quakers from Long Island. And uh, there was this uh, genealogy, the Seaman family of 
homestead and the Indian people lived there on that farm until they let them live there and uh, probably work for them or something. And one of the women was still alive and told the author of the book in the early 20s. says, oh, yeah, when uh, when um, well, the book was in the early 20s, the 1880s or so, still a woman who was, she said, I, I'm the storyteller for the Long Island Indians. I remember all this stuff. They tell me everything that needs to be known. Wow. I just got into this genealogy and she said, uh, yeah, when the white people first arrived and we saw the ships in the harbor, in the water, we thought they were big insects. <laughs> this is like, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the ark, the ship. Okay, so it weathers the storm. That's the integrity of the psyche going through challenge. And then the rainbow is, the creator puts the rainbow there, which is all the colors representing the multitude of creation that... Good. This is good. I will not again destroy the creation through water. He says through water. What else? He didn't say what else he might use. But <laughs> and we're waiting to see like right now. <laughs> right. And, uh, uh, yeah, neither the Hebrews nor the Mayas had another story of this. Uh, so we're still waiting to see what's going to happen. <laughs> but uh, so uh, um, so it's the integrity of the prepared soul or servant of God in a way, you know, listening. Um, it's interesting. Noah is called a tzaddik. That means a straight arrow. And you mentioned sin and um doesn't it? I, I can't remember whether it's Greek or Hebrew where the word sin means um, to miss the mark, yeah. but that is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's interesting too that sin would be like without, but then the same phonetic sin, S Y N, like synthesis, is like oh. combined, which is all kind of wow. like it's Jewish, you know, yeah. purified, purified and recombined. Like they say, yeah, to separate and and uh, conjoin, well, there's a saying, yeah, dissolve and I don't coagulate. Yeah. What about, this is not any Can you really Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, uh, um, so the rainbow happens and then yeah, so that's really, so, oh, he passed, he passed the test. That just represents, and this to me, this is, oh, well, then there's more. Okay, and then he built a vineyard and he got drunk and uh, was lying around drunk in his tent. So, <laughs> so this means to me, like, these three stories are the essential spiritual things we have to do. That is, be open to something other than ourselves, get outside that fig, <laughs> um, then through on the impulse we receive and then go through the storm that happens and these are the three laws in homeopathy that is the law of similars the law of direction of care that as soon as you give the right remedy the bad stuff the poison start to come out and discharge and come to the surface then there's what's called the healing crisis like uh, did i really want to go to this homeopath crazy person and like i didn't i don't know if i really want to you know shake myself up like this but you made it through you know and uh, to weather the storm and um so uh the plant here i could not help but immediately what could i have thought of or chosen but iris the rainbow so iris is greek for the rainbow and iris does mean to to me iris says i rise up out of the swamp to create the beauty you know and iris is open to the to above to the spirit i am open to the sun, to the spirit, to the creator above, and I rise up out of the swamp. And what I found about Iris is it's um, people just kind of get stuck in the bog. They can't, they can't rise above things like Noah did. And I, I, I use my a relative, my one of my aunts as a story here. It's so touching. She's she's a very touching person in a way. And so she said. Yeah, she's a slender, beautiful, dark-haired, I don't know, just this uh, archetypal iris, uh, and then and married, you know, and then 
has all these kids she can't manage and you know gets angry and hits them and stuff and and was an alcoholic and then so she goes to AA so she said yeah so I was an alcoholic so I went to AA and I, I had counseling and I got cured so then then I was addicted to cigarettes so then I had to get counseling and I I got cured of that so then I was addicted to Coca Cola. <laughs> And I had to get counseling. I got cured of that. <laughs> and then I knew, actually, she didn't give the rest of the history, but then she was addicted to collecting huge, those porcelain dolls, and they'd become millionaires by then. So big, huge, like 100 porcelain dolls all around the house. She's addicted to that. Okay. <laughs> okay, then one day all the, the dolls are gone. She's addicted to collecting quilts okay well that's pretty cool like that's actually an art object man tons of quilts she gave one to my parents like then one day all the quilts are gone and then she started collecting paintings like and one day there was less paintings but they weren't all gone and she started to paint and that was really to me she was she had risen up and finally flowered but she really was an artist she was creative and she had to get through all those addictions and this is a remedy for addiction but more it's like addiction to shopping and stuff it's to coca-cola it's not really it does actually help with high and low blood sugar blood sugar fluctuation also with fluctuating it's actually for leaky gut i found after years very mundane uses for leaky gut and that's that lack of integrity actually letting stuff in and then you you're liver your metabolism has to do the digestion so it's like thyroid up like god we got to burn all this stuff up and then blood sugar up and <clears throat> liver function up cells all active and then boom oh we got it done oh thyroid goes down blood sugar goes down oh man so eat a little a few nuts then but okay so that's kind of the physical expression but it really helps you rise above the swamp I think to get a better vision, I had never thought of it that way. Well, that's actually part of the story, too, that Noah sends out some crows to find the land and they never come back. You know, yeah. good, good for them. You know? <laughs> and then he sends out doves and they come back. <clears throat> but I think I never realized it until now. It's like the iris to get that higher vision over the swamp. Where is the land? Where do we go? That's the food. That what? Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh wow. Wow. Interesting. Gee. Arch. Arch. Oh yeah. Wow. And you do get a better view up there, don't you? <laughs> a lot of these things. Oh, that's another thing about the secret language of the shamans, etc. That in the root words, there's so much knowledge. And it's in everything, like it is in English and, you know, the old English. No, English also incorporated a lot of Latin and stuff. So, and then they cut all the spiritual meanings out in the 1700s, like the astrology and everything. So we got to restore that. But, but uh, all the languages have this. So. But you got to look for the roots more often. Yeah. So then he gets drunk and... Um, and this is he can't, that's the the minimum spiritual of life is to get the vision to follow through to go through the storm but there's four more lessons which is the wine of life i call it so this is the bread and the wine and that theme is used not just in the bible i mean it's in like celtic folklore it's just about everywhere everywhere where they had wine and bread it's like two different it's the mundane food and the refined food so um so uh also it's interesting there's a throwback it's interesting so ham is a son he says hey he's drunk like and the other sons like take a canvas and or animal skins and walk backwards and throw it on him to be honorable so there's a so there's someone who points their finger who didn't who made it all the way through the storm and still didn't figure out what the lesson was <laughs> i find that kind of interesting so i guess there's people that they'll make it and they they didn't get it but that's okay um let's see so um there is an interlude babel tower of babel forget that but um that's about the astrologers so um and astrologers aren't cursed, they just are not the answer for uh, ultimate theology, I guess you'd say, is kind of the story. Because of 
astrologers were the people who built the towers. So, okay, Abraham and Sarah. Um, so, in fact, he leaves the town of Haran, the center of star worship in late antiquity. Uh, Haran was the last pagan city in the West, survived until 1100, uh, 1100, even under the Muslims as a pagan center. And partly it was overthrown by peasant rebellion and partly the another set of pagans, uh, Muslims and uh, the um, Mo Mongolians. So we don't want a city there from a thousand miles away. They said, that's not a place we want a city. We're sending you a letter. If you don't destroy, if you don't leave your city, we're going to destroy it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Haran. Uh, no, Haran, H-A-R-R-A-N. It's in Southern Turkey. It's on right on near the Euphrates, etc. Still exists. I had a friend who went there said, yeah, the well where, where, uh, um, uh, Jacob met, um, Jacob met uh, Rachel is still there, you know, but there's all these like Coke cans and stuff at the bottom of it. <laughs> I was like, oh, golly. And then plus they built a dam and, and that made the foundations um, of sandstone and stuff get weaker and it's town is Wait, collapsing. Wait, are we in Babel? Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, well, so he starts out in Babylon, yeah. And from Haran, he gets the calling to go out and find a new land. Abraham does. Yeah, Abraham. And he goes, he's really the type of faith as even uh, St. Paul says in the uh, Gospels, um, he's, he's the, the Christian Gospels, he's um, the type of faith, of the man of faith who follows that. He's got, he gets the message and it's like, yes, I'll do that. It's on and on and on. And nothing's ever working out for him. He doesn't get the land. He doesn't get the sun, you know. He's, so his his wife says, here, my slave girl, sleep with her, like get, get your son on, with him, her. And, okay, so that's Ishmael, the father of the um, Arabs, and um, that was Hagar. And um, That's a good story. I mean, if folks don't know it, it's definitely yeah. worth knowing, right? Should we go into it some? I mean, does anybody not know the story of Hagar and Abraham? It's, I mean, and this is the story of, of sort of like the warring in the Middle yes. East, right? This is like pretty much the, you know, reason for their, well... You want to? You <laughs> yeah, well, so. It's kind of rough. I mean, it is rough. It's, it's kind of rough. It has. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, actually, for both sons, there's a chance of horribleness, but it works out, which is nice. It is a happy ending. Sort of. So, well, right. Who's okay. Sarah's son? So, Sarah's son is Isaac or Yitzhak. So, uh, and Hagar's son is Ishmael. So Sarah, they want to have a baby, but they're yeah. old, yep. right? And so they can't have a baby because well, Sarah's old. And so then say like, say, well, we'll, we'll have a baby with their handmaid, Hagar. So they basically like, it's a slave woman that they like, you know, decide to impregnate and then take her baby for Sarah's. And then Sarah eventually gets pregnant. And then she's like, well, I don't want your baby anymore. I want my baby. And like, yeah. they like, basically exiled Hagar and her son Ishmael. Well, on Sarah's command, because even uh, Abraham did not want that to happen. So he's developed... But he let uh, it happen. Yeah, uh, well, he was kind of forced to, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> there, there, may be, there, there, there may be a reason... Let's get on the woman, yes. Okay, there, okay. Sarah, Sarah's name is it's Princess, and she's one of the first Jewish American princess. She, she really is a bit of a, she's really a bit, a bit unkind. She, there's a lot of flaws in her personality, but I, 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 I'm not sure that Abraham treats her so well either, but, but at any rate, um, uh, at any rate, uh, we really, she really insists. Well, okay. So at any rate, so the, the, um, Ishmael's a teenager and then the, the angel comes and says, Hey, okay, you're going to have a kid. And, um, Abraham laughs, and the word, and he laughs in uh, disbelief. Sarah laughs at the messenger. Sarah laughs in um, bitterness. And then the baby's born, and he's named Yitzhak. He laughs, the laughter of joy. But it, when he's a couple years, when he's a young kid, then Ishmael laughs at him, mocks him, makes fun of him. So that's the negative laughter. So it's all, the whole thing is a play on laughter. 
and actually it enters a little bit more we see it more in uh isaac's life the in abraham and jacob and and uh, sarah but but at any rate they um uh there is this word plays on laughter which are just fascinating really um okay so sarah doesn't like doesn't want um Yitzhak around, uh, Ishmael around, yeah, and Hagar. It says, that spend them out in the desert, you know, get rid of them. And so, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, Abraham is kind of weak-willed in many different ways, many different times. But so he sends them out, and but he does give them water. And, um, nice yep, yeah. right. Well, it saves their life because they use up the water and, and Ishmael is crying and um, Hagar then sees as a vision, an angel shows her where there's a spring, and the spring is named. Then I have seen, and I have, I have been seen, and I have lived. And to see, to be seen means in Hebrew to be provided for. In fact, in Latin, vision and provision. So, and that ends into the story. That and these stories, these these word plays are incredible, really, and so beautiful sometimes. Although terrifying in this, because both sons go close to death. And Abraham says, please, God, please, can't he be my, can't he be my heir? Um, but um, isn't he good enough for you? No, he's not. He's not the chosen one. Okay, so Yitzhak is 10 years old, and the angel comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, Abraham, and he says, Hine, here I am. I'm here. Just period. By this time, he's just totally obedient. And uh, and the angel says, go up on the um mountain with your only begotten son and he lives in Canaan where they sacrifice children so he knows what that means so he goes up there with Isaac and the donkey covered when there's wood on the donkey and Abraham said and Isaac says uh, father there's the where there's the wood well, where's the sacrifice <laughs> which is really a terrifyingly poignant moment and abraham says it will be provided so they get up on the mountain and he ties isaac down to the pile of wood and he raises his hand to kill him and then the angel shows up and says yes says abraham abraham and he says he nay he look yes i am here he looks up says look over there there's a ram or look over there and then he sees a ram with a stuck in the thicket he knows ah that's the sacrifice so he sacrifices a ram not Yitzhak Isaac so in some ways this is like the Hebrews saying we're free of this human sacrifice thing we're not into that we God said we don't need to do that that's the ultimate sacrifice I might add to of, of this whole period of animal sacrifices um, so we're free of that but it's also and it's also like if you truly have faith, you don't need to impinge upon your kids, you know? You don't need to take from them, which people without faith will do sometimes, you know? And, and then, too, you are provided for, and there's that animal there. And it's interesting, because this is really, to me, this is the animal self, the, uh, where you have the dream when the shaman's okay. So when you dream of your animal self, you have eyes and ears in the other world. And as we see... We'll see Yitzhak. Isaac is the seer. Also, this mountain is called Moriah, the place of seeing, seeing and provision and provision. Uh, in the in the mundane sense, hill country or hill place. So they don't really know what they're referring to, but that Moriah means vision. Moriah. There's also the tree of Mora right there, and that's oh. the, that's the oak tree that Abraham got. Do you want to talk about? Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's the tree of Mora, and it, and it says, like, um, uh, Abraham traversed and as far as the sacred site of Shechem, as far as the oak of Mora. And that is, um, you know, it was probably like this oak that was festooned with all these, like, gifts and with mm -hmm. things hanging from it. It was probably an oracle tree, like in many cultures, the oaks were oracle trees. And, um, and this is where he had a vision, too. It's teacher tree. And mm -hmm. in, in the King James Version of the Bible, they pull out the, the teacher tree and they call it the Plains of Mora because you can't have a tree that, that is a teacher that's pagan. So they just changed it. Yeah, the King James Bible takes some liberties there. Yeah. 
um, I would say the biggest liberty that they take and other all the Christian Bibles mostly do is that they call uh, Sheol, the underworld, they call it hell, uh, which is actually Gehenna is what Jesus calls it. And it's not the same place. And in fact, I mean, so Abraham is in Sheol waiting, you know, I mean, that's where the dead go. It's a different place. It's not. So that's totally off. Okay. What? Gehenna was where they dumped garbage. So that's Jesus's metaphor for hell. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Sheol is just where the dead go, where every culture has, you know. So, um, okay. So, oh, this is all really interesting. So, riyat means seeing. More riyat, when the mem is placed before it, it means in Hebrew, the seeing is directed towards oneself. One is seen. So it means literally, I have been seen, um, which is very similar to what Hagar said. And Abraham says it. So there's a lot of stuff here. Also, this I found really interesting. So I went to the Quaker meeting down there in uh, um, North Carolina when I was teaching down there. And even the Quakers are fundamentalists down there, but their minister was a genius. Like I really, it was like amazing. So yeah, this one time he said, well, why is there a sermon on the Mount? So this is Jesus speaks sermon on the Mount and a sermon on the plain. You know, people say, Bible scholars say, well, it's the same thing, but Luke made it into a sermon on the plain and Matthew who was writing for the Jews made it into a mountain on the Mount. And like, yeah, the Hebrews, he said, what's the explanation? The Hebrews look to the mountaintops for, that's where God talked to them. Whereas the Greeks thought God came down to them. So they had to have it on a plane. And I was, I was kind of relieved, like, oh, I'm glad we got the, our idea of the wild, the beautiful spots where God talks to us is the, is the mountaintops. <laughs> we got that from the Jews, from the Jewish Bible. So, okay, so uh, uh, quite a powerful experience. Um, oh, and then biblical scholar um, Robert Alter, and actually he comes the closest. Robert Alter to this type of interpretation. He blends the meanings really exactly in his book on Genesis. <clears throat> Beyond the tunnel vision of a tra trajectory towards child slaughter is a promise of true vision. So... What's the plan? Ah, sagebrush. <laughs> but it's okay to use wormwood. Actually, out in the west here, you can use sagebrush. But wormwood, um, okay, both these plants can be used, and they are for dev out of devastation, life will spring up anew, was my interpretation of this whole. Letting go. Avery is the architect of letting go, letting go, letting go. And he um, lives and... Uh, he lets go, and finally, he does have the vision. Finally, his faith is rewarded. He has the holy land is granted his. It's shown to him. He has the child, the the son, the chosen child, and then he has the sacrifice, the ram. He connects. He's provided for on the mountain. Finally, he is has been provided for, and so um, uh, at it. Uh, and at any rate, you know, I know more about this stage now, and I might have changed to a more, I don't know, seership type plant, but but um, sagebrush, wormwood, this is really, like it grows in devastated places. It's the promise that out of devastation, life will spring up anew. So, it and, and actually, um, it's said to be, wormwood is said to be the most bitter herb in some part of the Bible. <laughs> and that, oh, in fact, the name I think is Marub, bitterness. It's the definition of bitterness, wormwood, which same species here as in Israel. So um, it is bitterness, and that's like Sarah. Out of that bitterness, life will spring up anew. There will be a new life. So it's the promise and of new things. And it's, it is really a valuable plant. A friend of mine called it uh, psychotherapy in a bottle. <laughs> about one drop a week you do not want to press it you don't want to have all your bad stuff come up all your stuff you don't want to think of come up too quickly and you can't handle it 
bring it up slowly. It brings up, it's not the shadow really so much as the pains and the, the deprivation, the poverty, the, the child abuse, whatever, all sorts of things are maybe even your own sins and faults. But they all, they come, this plant brings it up and it's like people have said, wow, I feel like I can deal with my problem now. And other people, well, I took so much that it all came up and I couldn't handle it anymore. So you don't want to do that. So it is a drop a week, a week or maybe two drops a week. Really, that's a lot for this plant. No, yeah. Sagebrush and wormwood, different. Okay, so they're both Artemisia uh, tridentata is the sagebrush of the West here, which is a woody plant that's mm -hmm. pretty common. Yeah. Okay, and then wormwood does have a little woodiness to it. Is it, that would grow in the city here. It'd be more kind of old, old stone wall. Wood. Wormwood is like the absinthium. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not native to here. But, no. But we have uh, mugwort. But very different than mugwort is too different. Yeah. And so if I make, yeah. But very different than sagebrush. It's oh, you know, different. mugwort actually fits here because that gives you the visions. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dun -dun -dun. Now we have to include it. <laughs> <laughs> And it, so they're all Artemisias, number one. Okay. okay. Artemisia tridentata is a sagebrush. And that is one of the sages the Indians use to purify. Um, actually, where I am, they like the, there's one in South Dakota they like better. Okay. It's sweeter. You know that one? Yeah. Sweet sage. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the Southern California one. It's, yeah. it's a, okay. <laughs> in Colorado, like sweet grass is different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I lecture and live so much in the Eastern part of the country. So I thought, well, there's not sagebrush around here. So wormwood, I started using that. Wormwood has exactly the same property of helping you through these problems that you just are stuck you know, you like, I would say the sagebrush person are, is a spiritual person. They have to ask first things. They're not about to, uh, you know, kill their brother or their kid or something. They want, they, but they can't go forward because they're so stuck in their pain. And wormwood helps you go through that or sagebrush, either one of those two. But mugwort might have to, I'll probably post something on mugwort to, uh, so Matthew Wood Herbalist, I'll probably put it on there. I have Matthew Wood, if you want to befriend me, don't forgive up on Matthew Wood. I already got five thousand people on there, so <laughs> I gotta, we gotta, I gotta switch over to Matthew Wood Herbalist. So, but and there, I'm gonna put more and more herbal stuff. So, like there was a great thing on Holly, um, but so now we're on, um, but so mugwort really does give people visions. Um, or rather dreams. And one woman said, I thought it was really the best explanation. She said, my dreams, I dream about the future and it happens. And so my dream life is connected to my physical life. And Dorothy Hall, the, the, so we'll talk about this plant. It's not in the book. We're talking about this plant, Mugwort, instead. Dorothy Hall, the great Australian herbalist, she said, so there's the nerve ring here, the um, autonomic nerve ring around the, the iris, interestingly, <laughs> in the iris around the pupil, and like, like that's one of the signs that you're still in your body, even in medicine, is like, does your eye work? Like light, boom, it dilates and oh, it, it gets smaller, rather, um, contracts, and then no light, it dilates. Um, so uh, that's the autonomic nervous system. It's involuntary. You cannot. Keep your eye open if you're staring at the light. It closes down. And so, um, like, uh, um, so she says that gaps in the nerve wreath, like, are breaks in your autonomic nervous system. And she used this for people who are constipated because they didn't get the signal. Like, they just don't get the signal, and they're really constipated. I had a little kid we gave this to. I haven't heard back, but he fit perfectly, and his brother needed it for the night terrors because that's another problem. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So, um, so this one, so this boy would poop in his pants because he just didn't think about it. He didn't get the signal. And um, so, okay, she also used it for severe insomnia. Like the person just cannot switch. They sit there, lie awake all night long, thinking, 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 thinking. 
and they just don't, they can't switch from CNS to ANS, autonomic, oh, sympathetic to parasympathetic, rather, from awake to sleep. And so there's like that gap there. And also then, it's famous, she doesn't mention this, but it's most used in old-time medicine, and I've used it a few times Well, for this brother, uh, su successfully, one drop a week. Um, mugwort for um, night terrors, that, so they wake up, but they're still part asleep, and they're terrified, actually, because they're, or at least, yeah, they're at least fearful. I wouldn't say they're absolutely terrified, but the word terror is a little bit extreme, but they're really discombobulated because they, they don't know what's going on. So that cured him of that. And um, so that's also a glitch in your nervous system. You can't get out of parasympathetic now to get into sympathetic. So you can't, so not here and, you know, taking that poop that's like autonomic again. Hey, guy up there, it's a snake down here talking, pay attention. <laughs> um, and so those are well-established uses, that gap. Well, I thought the gap between dream time and waking time, that's really also what this has to do with, too. And she, that woman described it so well that her, her dreams became reality, that they connected, you know. So, no, actually, I got to say, I don't believe in giving this to young kids too much because this, like, helps integrate parts of yourself, make you really complicated, integrate dream time, waking, all sorts of things. And it's like childhood is a more innocent time when it's just time to enjoy life. And this plant, you don't need to make kids more complicated. <laughs> if they got to integrate something, yes. If they got to figure out how to sleep, how to wake up, yes. But what about an autistic child who is very constipated because he's, he, he's like afraid to poop? That's interesting. Okay. You don't want to make it more complicated, but... Okay, um, that would be, I would again use one drop doses um, and with autistic kids, as you may know, like um, you detoxify them and then and the toxins go into the gut and that upsets them. So it's like as they're getting cured, they get worse, like it's really locked in. Um, they, they are kind of in dream time though, I gotta say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's almost like a good way to define where they are. Doesn't also mugwort like help with like... They are complicated too, excuse me. Sorry, they might be people that mugwort was well uh, positioned for, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like the story, the story that we're on is like, how do we integrate, like how do we look at our stuff? Right? How yeah. do we look at these things that are kind of ruling our lives? And it's like, in a way, mugwort helps us do that in dream time and helps us, like, sort of process all that. And, uh, like, so we don't actually have to do it so much consciously. Yeah. Well, no, I would, yeah. I think there's something there, too. Yeah. Closing a gap, that's true in a way. But I would say it comes through, it does come through. Well, it's bringing stuff from the unconscious to the conscious. So there is, yeah. But you do process it with, I believe, like the California Bay Laurel, which we'll just digress on. That helps someone, total fear all day long, didn't know where it came from, totally cured, still didn't know where it came from. Like, that's unusual. Usually these herbs make you process it. The California Bay Laurel is like crazy, you know. <laughs> so... Another thing with mugwort is it's really good for travel safety. Oh, okay. Travel, travel oh. safely. Getting across the gap. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Wow. I'm sleeping with it underneath just a sprig of it, like under your pillow. It's really strong. You don't even have to take his attention. It's just the essence of it. The smell can do. Yeah. Thanks. The energy of it. Yeah. Yeah, the energy of it. Yeah. yeah. Good. But that makes sense journeying too. So, um, so then Isaac and Rebecca. Um, so everything just happens easy for him. Instead of having to like, uh, like all the trouble a son goes through to find get a wife and ends up with four of them, he 
and he only wanted one to begin with. And so, but Isaac, oh, he just sees at the, in the distance, he sees Rebecca. Oh, oh, I'd like to marry her. So I'll send out cattle, you know, or something. Oh, okay, yeah, it'll all work out. Uh, after 20 years, oh, we haven't any kids. Like, gee, let's have, some, let's have a kid. Oh, okay, twins, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> so, and he lives at this, where Hagar lived, at the well of seeing and provision, see, uh, vision and provision, no, seeing and living, as Berlache wrote, um, seeing and, where, where I lived and I saw, or I saw the living one, um, which is a life of ease he has. I'm really actually glad about this, um, that there is a life of ease within the spiritual path, <laughs> the shamanic path. And this is for all of us. When we do all our work, there's times we can just sit down and that's okay. And I actually believe like, you know, according to the Hopis, we're going from the fourth world into the fifth world. And there are seven worlds. And it's like these seven rungs on the shaman's ladder. And it's the seven stories here. And we're going from the fourth to the fifth. And I find, it's like, we need a rest, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope okay but he also has the sight he's the incarnation of that the, he has the sight he sees Rebecca in the distance There's, he kind of and he's provided for so, so and then when he gets old he gets blind and he can't and then Rebecca she has the vision still she instructs Jacob to pretend he's Esau by putting... So Esau always brings animals, uh, the game from the hunt for Yitzhak, for Isaac to eat. And I think that's actually looked upon as a, some kind of representation of a character flaw or something by the authors because, like, the Hebrews were herders and they didn't like... And they were not hunters and they believed in raising the livestock, not going out and the hunting. And so, and Esau, the other brother, so he's, he's the hunter and he's a lot like a lot of their neighbors. And my dad, when I was in Sunday school, first day school, it would have been Quakers. Um, when, like he said, he read this story and he said, so why did the Jews pick as their cultural hero, this, the little brother who like was tricky and treacherous and everything, Instead of the older brother who was like Hercules, like all the other nationalities everywhere, they all, it's Hercules as their hero, you know, Esau. And I, he didn't answer it. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I want to know the answer to that. <laughs> and that actually was one reason I studied it too. Like, it was really very interesting. And what so, but Esau, I think, when you read the whole story, um, Esau's such a good person. He's just a good human being, but with no reflection. He didn't, I mean, he just says, uh, oh, I'm starving to death. Uh, and Jacob says, well, I got some lentils here, you know. Uh, yeah, I'd like some lentils. Uh, how about I'll trade you for, your, for the promised land, for your inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 and um, so, and he doesn't care. So, and then, but then he, he, um, uh, Isaac likes Esau and he wants to bless him. And um, Rebecca sees this and she says, Oh, Jacob, you got to trick your father. You put on an animal pelt, like your skin is hairy, like your brother's. And um, so that he knows it's, thinks it's, it's Esau and not you. This is, so he does that. He brings him, I don't know what he brings him, but it's probably not something he hunted. But then, so Isaac blesses him and gives him the blessing, which came from Abraham. I can't remember what the blessing is, but um, <laughs> but uh, then Esau comes and he says, but, but I blessed, I thought that was you. No, no, that my brother, he ripped me off. Like, oh, but bless me, father, please bless me. I mean, it's such a terrible moment. Like, he's so sincere and so kind. And, and uh, well, I mean, he's, he's a hunter and everything. He's just such a person, a good good person and Isaac says well I all I have left is uh, let's see how's his blessing go um, you will win everything by the, your bow and arrow and by your own hand shall you make yourself wealthy you know and find, find a country so he does that but 
he, he, it's different. So, so and then, um, oh, so seeing. So that's seership, to, to see. But we'll see later. Joseph is the one who really knows how to interpret. Not just see, but interpret. Okay, so uh, seeing. Um, the plant that came to me here, and I believe there's other ones too, um, cat's ears, which actually is native here. Well, if we if we threw in, uh, well, you know, we could we could come up with an Oregon um, thing. This would be along the coast, and this is a rarely used flower essence from the seven, and um, uh, cat's ears. It's calocortis, which is, means beautiful, lily, beautiful plant. It's really they are really There's beautiful. Here. Yeah. Sure. Have you ever seen the gray one? The, Great. It looks like a cat's ears. What's the Tommy eye? Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Great. I, okay. I don't know if it's here, but I've seen it. Yeah, along the coast, yeah. a little closer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in our biome. Um, so uh, it's the plant that helps you to kind of, um, I believe it helps you like. Uh, integrate your seeing with your life. Maybe that sounds like mugwort a bit, but um, to be a seer and to to be sensitive and to, it's like, it's like for me, like I always watch my thoughts before I go to sleep and try and learn. And then those thoughts have gotten stronger and stronger. And I feel like that's what, what cat seers helps you to be more sensitive to the nearly invisible. It's almost like that's cat's ear, like what? Yeah. Um, I do believe a possible similar plant is rabbit tobacco or life everlasting, which is similar in its associations. Rabbit ear, life everlasting, the easy life, the good life. Um, but um, so, and that does grow here, sweet everlasting too. But um, and what does that do for us? Jeez. <laughs> Well, that's got a pretty different. That's helps uh, peace with the dead. <laughs> that's the Indian remedy when the dead couldn't couldn't give you something, and they come back to haunt you, and then you dream of what they want. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Well, that's a vision of a certain kind. Okay, so cat's ears is a very is a herb is a flower essence and an odd one, and um, but it, you can get it from Flower Essence Society or make it yourself. And um, so that's on Oregon coast, yeah, yes, right. So, Calo Cortis, what is it the same as the one here? I, mean, one? I, I don't know what species there are here, so we would have to look. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to email me, I can look it up. Okay, some pictures. you have pictures of what you've seen here, yeah, yeah. What do you mean by here? Like, false okay. sandy line is also another name for it. No, no, you're no. thinking of cats. Um, that's you cats love what? Weed. You know, in the that's um, yeah. What's the scientific right. name on that? Hypocharis. Hypocharis radia. Yeah, no, this is totally. This is it's very different. This is the cats. Well, it sounds like it is pretty close in here. It's like a lily. Yeah. So. Is it called Pussiers? No, no, no. Uh, it's um, that's yet another plant. Um, Let's just stay with the Latin. Yeah. Okay. Calicortis. We're just gonna only do. We'll forget everything else. Calicortis. C A L O. I think C H O R T U S. Yep. Calicortis. R T S. Yeah. And then Tolmai. T O L M E I. So I want to get that one. C A L O. Yeah, it's a lily. It's a type of lily, and calicardus means beautiful flower. And it really that family, they are beautiful. So it's to help us um, help us have visions. Yeah, and to integrate them, yeah. And I would say maybe to make them more real in our lives, yeah. 
Yeah. And um, so how does that work in with like Jacob who stole? Well, okay. So Jacob is the one who is supposed to have the inheritance and the blessing, but he has to flee his brother's wrath and Jacob, the name means he who grabs by the heel, Yaakov, he who grabs by the heel. And in ancient writings, there is Yaakov El, he who grabs God by the heel, even. I remember talking to a fundamentalist Christian about this. I said, yeah, there's like people of faith, that's like Hebrew, that's like um, Abraham. And then there's people who are always making bargains with God. Like, if I do this, then I want you to do this for me. <laughs> <laughs> help us make our visions come true yeah it will become part of our life yeah Be, mm -hmm. yeah yeah um okay jacob he who grabs by the heel okay so he leaves home he goes to haran and meets up with his relatives there and he falls in love with um rachel rachel and um wants to marry her, but his father-in-law foists him off on the other daughter he didn't want. Around here, the younger daughter doesn't get married before the older daughter. And then he has to work a bunch longer for um, Ruckel, Leah and Ruckel. And um, so then they're his wives. And then I can't remember how he ends up with the two concubines or their servant girls also. Um, he has basically four wives by the time it gets going and 12 sons, one daughter. And so, but finally he wants to leave. He's, he's uh, gotten enough confidence. He's going to go back and face his brother. He's got to face his ultimate shadow. He's got to go back and he has fight various fights with Laban, his father-in-law. Uh, but he um, finally gets off, gets going and um, he gets to the fort of Jabbok, which is right at the edge of Esau's territory. Because Esau, by his own bow, has now become the king of Edom, southern Jordan. And um, at the fort of Jabbok, uh, a river that's still there, um, he stops and then he camps his people and he goes down to the fort. And uh, he fights with the angel as the, the famous uh, you know, thing. It actually says... Um, fights with a supernatural being. It's not clear exactly who he fights with, but um, probably with God, but it could just be, uh, but there's a lot of different variations on how you interpret it. So he won't let go. He And it's interesting here, this dust comes up again and grabbing by the heel, like the snake and stuff. And, the, and, and Esau, king of Edom, like Adam, he's kind of like the Adam, just the goodness of humanity. But, and, Jacob, though, is kind of like the self-reflection, and and he's not badness, but he's tricky, sly, etc. But but he, there are two sides, and they got to be separated now, and uh, the mind and the body to some extent. And so he fights with the being, and he won't let go. He grabs hold, and he won't let go. And finally, the being, a sunset, a sunrise is coming, says, "Let go, let go." And he says, "No, I won't. Not until you bless me." that's grabbing hold okay and uh he says by what name do men call you yaakov he who grabs by the heel no longer shall men call you that for you have striven with beings divine and human anashim and elohim it's great poetry in uh, hebrew and you have prevailed and therefore and so he gets a blessing and he says your new name now is yisrael Israel, uh, which means he who sets an order before God, he who sets troops in order, like prince before God, because the prince has troops to set in order before the pharaoh or the king. Uh, he has troops to bring. And um, prince before God, uh, he who organizes, who is like your life is organized in another way. Like, um, and it's kind of, there's a lot more to it. I'm not going to go into it. It's kind of peculiar um but he he set his own life in order and and he wrestled with his demons right yes he was willing to go back yep. and, and fess up to his brother yep. and, and yep. like 
make things right, yep. and he wrestled with God and yep. sort of making amends to it all. Yep. He's prepared and he'll and he's willing to face it all. So uh, so and then the being hits him on the hits him on the hip and dislocates his hip. And that's why the Jews never eat the the Hebrews never eat the sinew that crosses the hip. That's not kosher. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not a butcher, so I don't know. <laughs> but it, that's so clear, and I'm sure they don't. I'm sure that's not kosher. So to this day, as the author says, so authoress, so um, oh, that might have been E actually. E is more favorable to Jacob. So, um, so he sets his, so he crosses everybody over the fort, and he sets everybody in order with his least favorite. Um, slave wife, then his more, more favorite slave wife, and then his less favored wife, and then his more favored wife and their kids, and all of, and he sends servants ahead with livestock on and on, on, probably hundreds or at least dozens of livestock on and on to, to Esau and Esau said, what, where is this all coming from? This is from our, our we are servants of, of Jacob, he's your brother Jacob, he's sending, please, you know accept these gifts, on and on, and so finally finally Jacob shows up and um, Esau is there and Esau's angry, but then he just forgives him. He just like falls on his shoulder and cries and he's so happy to see him. Doesn't say that Jacob cried, <laughs> 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 but Esau did and Jacob and um, so then they exchange pleasantries, but Esau has learned something. So he says, um, Oh, let's see. So you have a claim to the land on the other side of the river of Jordan, and uh, you don't have any claim on the land on this side, huh? Because he wants to make sure that he's not going to take, take this land to it. So, nope, that's your land. You got, that belongs to you. So they part ways. They're they're reconciled, and uh, Esau has the title to his land. So, so. Um, so it's really interesting, quite a difference there. And um, uh, and uh, there, the story of Jacob, there's all sorts of other things that, that go on. Oh, let's see. Uh, so the great plant of grabbing hold fits here so well. Black cohosh, very Eastern North American, not anything um, Levantine or... There's not a, oh, it does grow in Oregon. There's a there's, little, there's two acteas that grow here as to whether they're um, similar to, to the Simsipiga. Yeah, they're so rare that nobody would pick them, I think, but a total stinker. Um, there's uh, tons of actea around here. Oh, there is? Yeah, there's two species and there's tons of it. Oh. Is it considered black cohosh? Well, it's debatable because black cohosh has changed its name from Simisifuga to Actea and back and forth. And I, well, the botanist did it. What? The botanist did it. I, yeah, I'm unclear. We have to just try. I, I think most people consider all the Acteas or Simisifugas to be interchangeable, at least as far as southwestern in the like uh, Sedona and Flagstaff in those valleys. There's still a Simisifuga. Um, and it's different, but it's used interchangeably with all these other ones. There's enough of it. At least there was in Michael Moore's day. Yeah, they both have the same similar effects. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I think probably this black coash can be used. I didn't realize it was that numerous. I knew it was a, there was a vestigial population on Mount Hood, and it must just be up in the mountains at various Not places. Ashland, there's a lot, and there's two oh. species, and one of them supposedly doesn't have the hormonal. And the other oh. one does, but they all are really relaxing to smooth, mu to smooth muscle or, or like yeah, letting go. Ah, but grabbing hold and for people that grab hold too hard, yeah. So it's a great muscle relaxant. Um, black coash, like kind of uh, it helps you. It does help you kind of see your demons in a sense. Um, it's, it's for people who are too brooding, pensive, introspective. It helps you get out of yourself and to get into the world, and uh, it's really. Um, well, it's very good for PMS when you have a dark brooding sense and you kind of trapped inside yourself. Trapped inside yourself fits so well this remedy. 
Uh, yeah. I wonder, um, I'm just thinking my father died of a dementia where oh. he could not express himself. Oh. So, um, yeah. Um, getting outside yourself, yeah. Um, which Jacob kind of, kind of does at the end, too. Um, but at any rate, you're too grabbed hold. You're too tight. It loosens you up. So uh, this is a very good remedy for whiplash, which produces that same black brooding state of mind. Otherwise, it is mostly used as a female remedy, although it, it is a, a bronchitis and asthma remedy may be entering into some uh, pneumonia, but um, more bronchitis and spasmodic asthma. It's interesting, the eastern one, I don't know if this is true of the western, you might know, when you smell the flower, it has, it kind of like makes you feel like, God, oh, I'm stuck in a, it's like feeling like you're st stuck in a closet or something, stuffy air. It gives a sense, a smell of stuffy air. So one gets the feeling, oh, open up the lungs. One really gets that. I do not use it for that, but a lot of good herbalists do. So I can recommend it that way. Um, so it's one of several good antispasmodics for the lungs. So lungs, uh, it does reduce high blood pressure. So it is for the cardiovascular system. It's not really a heart remedy. Uh, uterine, certainly. I think spinal, it looks like a spine. Whiplash, usually there has been an injury to the spine. But I think if someone was just tightened up somewhat, it releases the cerebral spinal fluid, and that releases from the mind and the brain, uh, soothing, yeah, like that. Um, it's, uh, and I would think into the limbs and stuff too. So, okay, um, really nice herb. Uh, drop doses are fine. I would not use big doses on this. Um, and I would make the plant from the Fresh. If if this plant grows on Mount Ashland, there's no doubt you could grow the black cohosh in your yards here with a little bit of water. Mount yeah. Ashland's a different climate than down here. It's much yeah. Better. Okay, but I still think you could do it, but you'd have to water it. Yeah. yeah. And you might want to plant it. Oh, it likes the shade in the east. I'd plant it in a shady spot. Like it's hard to grow down in like Sonoma or something. Oh, I had a friend who grew a lot of it on the. Um, Ocean side of San Francisco, the, you know, down there where it gets really cold and damp and not that much sun. It grew, it loved it there. <laughs> so I'm sure you could plant some of this along the coast too. So, oh, let's see. I am not going to go into that. I probably don't have time, but uh, oh, so these are all flower essences, although the root is used, has about the same properties as the flowers. Yeah. So, and you certainly could try the flowers from the mountain up here too. Yeah. Okay. So the final story then is Joseph, and this is such a great story. He, the dream. He. So Joseph is the chosen son, like the son of the favorite wife who dies. Then, story behind that. And there's only two boys that are born to her, Benjamin and Joseph. Yosef which means to multiply or to subtract. I think it's the name for geometry, actually. And at that time, maybe they, they weren't like the Greeks quite so into it, but... Um, oh, Joseph in, the, in the, the last, he's the son of, the son of uh, Jacob. Yeah. He's the one who works, for, goes to, he ends up in Egypt. Okay. Okay, so... Yes, right. He has, so... He has dreams of, um, like, greatness that he's going to rule over his brothers. But not only does he dream about it, he goes out and tells them, oh, yeah, I had a dream last night that all you, all you guys borrowed down to me. You know? <laughs> so, thanks a lot. <laughs> his father then gives him the coat of many colors. Like, okay, he's the overseer. He's in charge of the farm, the animals, everything. You guys all work for him. I was like, oh, really? Like, and then he, like... Uh, is a tattletale, you know. Oh, so and so did so and so. They don't like him at all. So finally, then Judah, the hard nosed um, so, uh, son, all the other brothers, they throw him a pit. They're going to kill him, they decide. But no, there's a slave caravan going by to Egypt. And so they sell him into slavery. But they um, put animal blood on his, on the coat of many colors. 
and bring it back to Jacob. And Judah is a really hard person. He says, here, look at your son. Look, see, this is your son's coat. He's been killed by a wild animal. You know, really pretty nasty. And, uh, and he said, and he rips his clothes and he said, never again will I, and will I be happy. Cause Jacob does. Yeah. So, and, and Judah's willing to do that. You know, Judah's kind of the leader. And uh, so Joseph goes off to Egypt. There's two stories here, Judah story with Tamar and then the Joseph story <coughs> with, um, in Egypt. So he goes to Egypt. He's sold, this little, um, sold into slavery. He's such a good manager. He becomes the overseer of the of his owner's estate. His owner loves him. He's doing a really good job. But his owner's off one time. His wife makes a pass at Joseph. And Joseph's like, oh, no, no, I, I, I don't want to get involved here. And so then she like bad mouths him. Like, Joseph tried to come on to me. <laughs> and so he gets thrown in prison again. So uh, he's in prison, but the jailer realized how good a manager he is. So pretty soon he's the manager of the prison. And, <laughs> and then he interprets dreams. He interprets the dreams of two people and they come true. And so some years pass and then the Pharaoh, the, dream, the jailer is a servant of the Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, I had a dream and I need an interpreter. And the jailer says, oh, I know somebody, what? I know somebody in the jail that can, and he's a great interpreter. So he brings him to Pharaoh and he successfully um, interprets the dream as it turns out. And, and uh, which has to the fat, the fat cattle and the lean cattle. And, and so Pharaoh makes uh, Joseph the overseer of all of Egypt. So he's in charge of everything. He does rise to the top. And then, of course, there's a famine and his father and brothers have to come and their wives and kids have to come down to Egypt to seek water. So there they all, his brothers bow down to him. So they don't even know who he is because here's this, you know, dressed up like a pharaoh, like this, all in jewels and masks and things, clothes, and this guy. And they say, oh, please, could you, you know, could we come and stay here? Yeah, yeah, okay, you can, yeah. Like, so he makes up a test then where he puts a, yeah, like a, a stolen plate in Benjamin's pack and his pack animal on his pack. And then and so look, we found this stolen. What you guys, we give you this right to stay here and you're stealing from us. And no, no, please, we don't want. And like, and, and uh, Judah's a spokesman. And he says, this is our father's favorite son. And the other son died and from the favorite wife. And please, this will break his heart. We just, I will go in his place. So Joseph forgives Judah. It doesn't say that, but that's obvious. So he says, well, he does. He says, he, it, it, it's he really, realizes that Judah has, has made amends for his mistake and he would never make that mistake again. Yep. Yeah. So then they live happily ever after. <laughs> and that's how the Jews come to Israel. I mean, that's how the Jews come to then, Egypt. That's how they all come because there's a famine. And yeah. And then, then of course, they become slaves in Egypt. Exodus. Yeah. But there's a whole different story about Judah that's really interesting. We're going to kind of run out of time. But um, so Judah um, goes, so he's, uh, he doesn't care what his mom and dad say, um, what uh, Leah and um, Judah uh, Joseph say that he that is like, yeah, stay here with us and marry a woman we approve of. Ah, I'm going to live with the Canaanites and I'll live according to their laws. And I marries a Canaanite and has a bunch of sons, Wait, three sons. Judah? Yeah, Judah. 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 Okay. And he lives, he's got a, uh, Adulam is the name of the town, justice of the people. So he's like, it's kind of, he's, he's kind of a secularist, I would say. <laughs> and, uh, or at least he's a, he's a Canaanite in his religion. So, so, but he's really a secularist. He just, he doesn't really believe in anything. And, and he's just mouthing the laws. And so then he has three sons and he gets a Canaanite woman, Tamar. Tamar means date palm. So you almost, well, we'll see why that, even that significant. But so she marries the oldest son. He dies. He's not found good. The Lord did not approve of him. He dies. Okay. So the second son is the famous Onan who spilled his seed upon the ground. So he doesn't consummate, consummate the marriage and God doesn't like that and kills him. But the actual crime here is not masturbation, but um, the, the second son is supposed to get the, the widow of the first son pregnant and the 
first boy is considered to be the heir of the first son and gets the estate and and the second son doesn't get the estate still even though it's his son uh, and so this is an important law and, and that's what he's actually breaking he doesn't want to get Tamar pregnant he wants to get he wants to wait until Jacob dies and then he gets the inheritance and then he can have kids so so God doesn't like him either so there's one third son but Judah's like this woman's bad luck I'm not going to marry her to him so she's just a useless nobody in the household and then so she figures something out so she goes along the road she sets up the red tent that's the prostitute so tent and and the Canaanite prostitutes are actually part of the religion there they're sacred prostitutes so, so Judah's going along and says, oh, oh yeah oh here and so he has sex with her and then but he doesn't have any money and so she says oh and she's veiled and everything so okay we'll leave your staff and your sign your seal um that you sign your documents with like and in like even in, in jerusalem when i was there like the rings the palestinians would wear this like the ring would have a seal on it that, you know for the document yeah so um so okay i'll be back up with the money okay well next day she's gone and, and he asked at the village what well, was there a cult prostitute here no we never had anybody like that around here huh okay well so a couple months by tamar's pregnant by whoredom and J J judas says take her out and burn her and <laughs> and she says i am pregnant by the man to whom these belong the staff and the seal and he's like oh she's in the right and i'm in the wrong because he owed her a husband and uh um so she bears the sons through and one of them is the great grandfather of king david so but what's the last plan uh, yeah yeah okay well she's the warrior she's i think really fits she's the spiritual warrior joseph is the manager or the seer or the yeah, Tamar. Tamar means date palm. So it is through her that justice comes because date palm is the symbol. Even today, the courthouses have those pillars. That's the date palm. Oh. I just ran out, or I'm about to run out. So I got to talk. It's Easter. It's lady slipper. Okay, unfortunately, this is a really endangered plant, but you can use the flower without killing the plant. You can use other orchids. They grow your nerves. They really... Um, Mm, there's other plants that do that too. Geez, that's like that's the, what we need. Um, grow your serotonin, like your self control, your ability to. Uh, so you got your serotonin receptor sites, and that's where the DMT goes to. And the DMT has been shown to expand them, and people actually become more able to control their, their to fulfill their life, to be who they should be. Joseph and um, Tamar to take it if they have to. Either they both are set back, but. Um, uh, do what is right for them. That's what, so um, Lady Slipper to me represents when you are following your path and you don't have confidence. Oh, am I on the right path? Self-doubt. You shouldn't have that. No, this is your path. Um, or that just to enjoy and to be there and to not, it's like it is very relaxing in the nervous system. I actually did have a tincture of it one time because the Amish had made some and I was like, you're harvesting that. Like, I didn't say anything, but then it's, well, it really builds your nervous system. Now, the only way we can substitute this is with other orchids, like the Chinese dendrobium might be possible. Um, Seven Song introduced to Haber, Habernaria, which is an, a, a, if the, it's unbelievable there is such a thing. Habernaria is a naturalized foreign invasive orchid. <laughs> what about Ephrocactus? That's another one. Yeah, yeah. No, I've never seen that one. I've only seen the Habernaria, and there was not a ton of it, but it was an invader. But um, so to um, really anchor the nervous system and um, be who you should be. So I also, but one lesson here, those adolescent dreams of glory, that's what he has. And that's what we all have, and we all should follow those dreams. Those dreams are based on our destiny, and they're really important. So, um, 
Honestly, you said animal. Yeah, Lori, just like the things you, I don't mean literally, but your daydreams, your dreams. I want to do this with the world. I want to, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like that is the real you. That is you dreaming your destiny ahead of time. And we say, oh, I got to get a job and like, you know, behave and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to be an herbalist. Jeez. <laughs> but you don't have a choice. So, um, yeah. So, so that's the lesson of Joseph and of Tamar and um, of Lady Slipper is fulfilling your destiny. And those two do it. Joseph totally passively rises to the top because of his. And Tamar, the exact opposite, grasps her, her, um, her uh, destiny and won't let go. And so she really tames um, Judah, too. And he returns to his family eventually. So she's really quite redemptive, very important, and very honored. And it's made clear in the <clears throat> story that she is the grandmother, great-grandmother of King David, so the culture hero. So there's the end. We have a few minutes. Any questions? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm unclear on, you've talked about the use of both flower essences, but also herbs. herbs. Yes. That's, that's, okay, that's a good question because I tend to blur that. And, um, oh, yeah, been, yeah. and um, uh, it would be nice, um, like, I look to the healing part of the herb as the essence, and I don't mean flower essence, but like the homeopathic essence or the flower essence or just the, the herb, it's raw, it's like, it's archetype, it's like primal, what it is. It's spirit, yes. And so I don't care so much about its method of preparation, but it is absolutely true in this case that the flower essence doesn't like have that effect on the nervous system that the plant does, but we, we can't use the root because anyway, I mean, in England, there's only one left and maybe there's two now, but you know, in Europe, it's almost extinct. Eastern North America, it's like 99% reduced through logging, farming and picking. Ladies. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in places in Northern Minnesota where there was like a thousand, you know, yeah, you've seen those. Yeah. But, you know, that's just the little remnant places where, you know, there's probably millions of them in North Minnesota, but not elsewhere. But I grew yellow ones in my garden. Oh, you did? Oh, good. And it's not the pink ones. The pink ones are the wild ones. How do they No, the yellow ones are wild, too. Well, but the yeah. pink ones are the penguins. Pink ones, excuse yeah. me, are Minnesota state flowers, so you it was illegal to pick them. So yeah, do it's anything near them except say hello. How did yeah. they get so just decimated? Because of logging, farming, okay. uh, and picking for use. Yeah, I mean, also okay. So they are also a aphrodisiac, um, reputedly. Um, so that's part of it too. I mean, not now, but in the former times. Yeah. Oh, it does actually help like if you got a fetish or something a sexual fetish it actually has freed several people from that so yeah so that's good that's like having something that's blocking your actual true dream yeah what that's yeah that's the flower essence too yeah yeah that's growing new herb nerves maybe the outgrowing there's a couple of herbs for that but i'm not going to go into them now but but um ask me in class <laughs> um yeah so they're all illegal actually to pick in minnesota but the, i think maybe they've domesticated the yellow one well, so, so you can buy it yeah it was somebody going out before they um built the development Freeway, yeah. condos in the middle of the yeah. woods yeah um this guy went out in yeah. front of the yeah tractors or whatever and cracked it and yeah I got it. Yeah, there's licenses for that. Yeah. yeah, and you actually do have to transplant it with the soil because it's it's the genome, the whole, the biome there is. It's the fungal. It absolutely does. It's. And they're, and they're, they're finding out that that's, that's the case in a lot of situations. And probably most of the situations, you need the entire ecosystem. 
you can't just like, oh, yeah. I'm going to grow such and such here. Yeah. I wish I could can. So, yeah, like you could try and grow in the mountains here, but I don't think it would grow here. It's other mountains. <laughs> so, it wouldn't have the spiritual aspects, yeah. the, the energetic stuff that it needs to thrive. Like same way. Yeah. So herbs are more strong when they're natural in the wild. Wild crafting is though cultivating the area so that you pick and leave some and they come back and that's you're managing with permaculture. Native Americans did that totally. Um, so you don't overpick it. But uh, and then but you know, we need our garden plants too and um, this is a great climate that's kind of semi-Mediterranean a little bit so that you can grow a lot of those European plants that are really great too. Um, but I would think in the more, in some of these, uh, in shadier places and things, you could grow a lot of these Eastern woodland plants too. So, yeah, and under, in the oak woods or a lot like the oak woods of the East, well, somewhat, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, you mentioned um, when we were talking about your son, you mentioned something quick about sulfur. Yeah, so sulfur is the homeopathic remedy that kind of blows all the dirt out. It really is like, hey, I gave the right remedy. It's not working. Oh, I'll give sulfur. And that like gets that law of direction of cure from the inside to the outside. Gets that government from center to circumference would be what they would say. Gets that all smoothly flowing so that you can continue with the remedies that are needed. Um, I haven't gotten good with sulfur. Uh, I took it recently myself. It, when you itch and stuff, I've been itching a little bit. So it's like, it's just like sulfur. It's good. Oh, I got, I got something in making me itch. So, any other it's questions? Sulfur down our socks for chiggers. Oh, oh my. Yeah, there's a curse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at MatthewWoodInstituteOfHerbalism.com. You can find all of our social links in the description below. Also, please subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with the latest videos.